on the Hermia of the Gospels, part 36. Ugh, is this ever going to end? I don't know. I keep asking this question, how many parts is there going to be? I don't know, but we're on part 36. Let's begin this one in Matthew 17. Matthew 17. We'll start in verse 24. <clears throat> now after coming to Capernaum, those who received the tribute money came to Peter and said, Does not your master pay tribute? What is this tribute money? Is it a tax or something? It was, yes. What was it for, and how did it all begin? Anyone remember that? We'll have to go back to Exodus. Exodus 30. Tribute money. What on earth is this tribute money? It's interesting, because, I mean... We're doing a Bible study, right? This is a Bible study. So when you read something like that, you have to pause and ask the question, well, what is this tribute money? Don't you? Well, Exodus 30, verse 11. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When you count the children of Israel, of those who are to be counted, then they shall each man give a ransom for himself to the Lord, when you number them, so that there may be no plague among them, when you number them, they shall give this, every one that passes among those who are counted, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 garas. I don't know what a garah is. You, know, you guys can do your own study on that kind of stuff if you want. I'm not going any further than that. A half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Everyone that passes among those who are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering to the Lord. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel. When they give an offering to the Lord to make an atonement for yourselves. And you shall take the atonement silver of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service, for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation so that it may be a memorial to the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for yourselves. Now, there's a lot of things that they had to do for atoning. <clears throat> this, was, this was another one. This specific one was for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation for the temple. The, in Jesus' time, they called it the temple tax to... Well, we have a government right now, don't we? How does the government function? We pay tax to it, don't we? That's what this was for, this, this kind of a thing. And if we look in Exodus 38, same thing, just a little bit more expanding on it. Exodus 38, verse 25, And the silver from those numbered of the congregation was a hundred talents, and 1,775 shekels after the shekel of the, shank of the sanctuary, and a bakah for every man, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary for everyone that went to be numbered, from 20 years old and upward, for 600, 3,550 men. That's quite a lot. And the bases of the sanctuary were cast of the 100 talents of silver, and the bases of the veil also, a 100 bases of the 100 talents a talent for a base. So they, they, it helped build this thing. It helped form this structure. You can't have a government. You can't have parliament without taxpayer money. You can't. It just won't happen. <clears throat> so, if this was required, of the Jews at the time, 
And these people were coming to collect this money from Jesus and his disciples. Right? Were they paying it? Were they paying it? Interesting. Well, I want to go to uh, 1 Peter 18... 1 Peter 1, 18, 19, first. This is also a reminder, this, this tax was a reminder that, that we had been redeemed from the slavery of Egypt, but today we have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. This, it was, this also was, there was a reminder that they had been redeemed and they had to pay back for that. 1 Peter... 118 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed by corruptible things, by silver or gold, not by silver or gold, which in old times you had to pay a temple tax to. You were not redeemed by silver or gold from your futile way of living, inherited by tradition from your forefathers. This temple tax. You're not redeemed by that. You're not. You're redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. This temple tax was another way of being redeemed before God. That's one of the traditions of the forefathers. That's how they saw it also. And this tax went to sustaining the temple functions. But you're not redeemed by that. Jesus Christ changed that. You're redeemed by the blood of Christ. Peter didn't know what to say or do in this instance when these people came. No. Those who received the tribute money came to Peter and said, Does not your master pay tribute? Peter's like, um, yes, <laughs> is what he says in, in verse 25. Peter didn't know what to say other than yes. But then he went to ask Jesus about it because he didn't know what to really do about it. Right? <clears throat> This temple tax was still in effect after the destruction of the temple in, in 70 AD. I mean, the Romans collected this thing afterwards. It's called the Fiscus Judaicus or something like that. You can look that up if you want to. But that's irrelevant for their, our discussions. Peter went to Jesus and he said, yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus anticipated his question. Jesus knew who was at the door, and he knew what the matter was about. And he said, what do you think, Simon? What do you think? This has been a tradition for a long time, since the time of Moses. But what do you think about this? From whom do the kings of the earth receive custom? Or tribute from their own children or from strangers from strangers Peter said yes from strangers then the children are indeed free very strange very strange statement Jesus says there but yes it's a true statement the children of the kingdom are free of the things of this earth nevertheless so that we may not offend them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up, and when you have opened its mouth, you shall find a coin. Take that and give it to them for me and you. From whom do the kings of the earth receive custom or tribute? 
We have to pay our taxes, don't we? We have to. That's just something we have to do. What does that have to do with anything in a godly sense, though? Nothing. Nothing. Does that contribute to our salvation in any way, shape, or form? No. Not at all. But it's something that we have to do to uphold this country that we have, to make things function. But it has nothing to do with the weightier matters of what really is important, which is our salvation in the kingdom of God. Most are strangers. The word strangers here is most do not understand the word of God. Most do not. Most are enslaved by the world as we see it. And they don't understand the purpose of God. They, 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 they don't. And of course, all they do is you know, work day to day, raise their family, pay their taxes, but nothing more happens. When you have, when you have this, this knowledge of God and Jesus and, and salvation, the trials and tribulations of this world aren't really that hard to understand anymore. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a big deal. You just, you have to overcome every day. You do. And it's hard sometimes. But it's not that big a deal in your life. Interesting what, what uh, Jesus says to Peter here, though, when he says, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. Peter normally fished with a net. He would throw a net into the, into the, into the waters and pull up whatever he caught. He never usually went and, and with a hook and throw a line in there to catch one fish. But this is what Jesus told him to do. Sometimes fish will swallow something that's not food for them, right? Sharks do that all the time. You know, <laughs> sometimes they'll swallow a license plate or mm -hmm or a bottle or a can or something like that. Apparently, a fish in this big sea swallowed one of these coins. It obviously happened. And Jesus told Peter to go, right? Put a hook on a line, throw it into the water, and the first fish that you will catch, it will have... <laughs> this coin and then go and pay this temple tax amazing now we don't read beyond this that Peter actually went and did this but we assume that Peter did Peter would have done that and he would have gone you know, he would have done this and would have caught this one fish with this one hook pulled it up and opened his mouth and sure enough there was this coin this would have happened and it would have strengthened Peter's faith as well. That's an amazing thing. Has anybody fished? Have you ever seen anything in a fish that was foreign, like a coin or, or, or anything? With one fish, the first fish. That's, that's just astonishing. <clears throat> but that's what Jesus told Peter to do, and that's what Peter went and did, and that's what happened. You know, that's a miracle. You know, it's something that we, we overlook sometimes when we, when we read through this. But that's, that's quite astonishing. And I'm sure Peter found it astonishing too. And when Peter went to go and actually do this, 
did he really think, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm going to catch this one fish and there's going to be this coin in there. Did he? <laughs> yep. Put yourself in this place, right? Right? You're Peter. You're going, you know, yeah, Jesus said to do this, right? Yeah, okay, I'm going to do this. And there's going to be a coin. <laughs> he probably thought that, right? But he also probably thought, yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah, it's going to happen. Because all the other miracles that he saw Jesus perform, that would be pretty awesome. You know, that would be pretty awesome. You know, I'd like to do that. You know, these guys, in, in some ways, were, were very lucky to uh, to be there in Jesus' time, to be there with him, to learn from him directly. Can you imagine, for one instance, being with Jesus for three and a half years, listening to him every day, hearing what he had to say all the time, witnessing what he did? I mean, we read a little bit of what actually there was. But to be there, to see him, to be a friend with him, A close friend. These guys were close friends with him. And he was a close friend with them. He loved them. He, they loved him. Yep. I'm envious in a little way about that. But there's nothing I can do about it. But I can, I can think about it. And it's, it's pretty amazing when I, when I, when I do. So let's go to chapter 18, which is a very deep subject, this one. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's an odd question. Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And after calling a little child to him, Jesus set him in their midst. <coughs> And he said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, there is no way that you shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Number one, you have to be converted. You have to turn from your ways of this world and to follow Christ. You have to. And not, not in a pretend way, not in, not in a way that's okay, I'm just going to cover all my bases and then yeah, I'm going to go to church on I'm going to go to church on Easter and Christmas because that, those are really important days, right? But the rest of the time I'm not going not to bother. No. You have to be converted and then become as little children. What is special about children? Yes, they are. They're also very rebellious, too. Yeah. Right? And they're also very selfish. They, they think of themselves and their own needs and, and whatnot. They don't tend to think of other people. However, however, the quality that Jesus is referring to is that they are very open to be taught. And if your mother or father and if you have little children, you know that they look up to you and when you tell them something, they believe it. Because they don't believe that you would lie to them about anything. They are totally open and they are inquisitive and they are trusting. Trusting. That's a huge thing. Trusting. How trusting are you in, in Christ? And in the truth? A lot of people are not like that. A lot of people doubt. A lot of people question. A lot of people argue about very basic truths. 
and they get very self-righteous about that. No, you have to be trusting of what Jesus says. And there's a lot of what Jesus says in here. And you take him at face value. And his disciples were with him for a long time. Years already. And they asked him this question. Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Very strange for them to ask that after all this time being with him. And he again humbles them. Don't think of it like that. Why do you try to set yourself up to be something more? Humble yourselves. Be a servant. Be like a little child. If you are not, there is no way that you shall inherit and enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever shall humble himself as this little child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Have humility. Don't think of yourself as something more than you are. And you, but you are very special. Because God is working with you and is transforming you to be like him. So you are very special. But don't get puffed up about it like that. Don't get arrogant about that. You can't be like that. The Pharisees had a lot of trouble with that because they were puffed up. They thought themselves, well, we're Abraham's seed. You know, we're something special. No. No. You're nothing. If you think that. You know, God can raise stones up to be seeds of Abraham, children of Abraham. Having a humble nature and having a servant attitude is what's most important. A servant attitude. Christ came to serve. Christ came to sacrifice himself. And whoever shall receive one such, one such little child in my name receives me. Mark goes into that as well. I just want to read Mark 9. Mark 9, 33. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing among yourselves on the way here? <clears throat> but they were silent because while on the way, they had discussed who would be the greatest. <laughs> Jesus knew what they were discussing. He knew what was in their thoughts. He knew what was in their minds. And he called them out about that. Who is the greatest here in this room? It certainly isn't me. It's not me. You're sitting here listening to me yabber. Right? Where does that place me? I'm here, I'm doing this because I have to. It doesn't give me any special place. You know, I'm not elevated into some special realm, right, that you have to go and be in awe, like, oh, this, this, guy's, a, this guy's like a preacher. And he, you know, I have to be very careful around him or, or revere this guy. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. Any one of you, right, that's why I asked in, in the beginning, too, who has ever prepared a Bible study or a, or a sermon? Who's ever done that? It's hard. It really is. And you have to you have to really work at it. It's not something that just comes easy. But God helps you, right, when you when you actually delve into it to do so. And you can actually do it. It's like asking somebody to uh, give a prayer opening or closing. Right? 
you can do it. And that's the first step. Then he took a little child and set it in their midst, and after taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever shall receive one such little child in my name receives me, and whoever shall receive me does not receive me only, but him who sent me, which is God. Luke 9, 46, 48 says the very same thing too. Then John answered him, this is still Mark 9, saying, Master, we saw someone who does not follow us, casting out demons in your name. And we forbade him, because he does not follow us. Jesus said, Do not forbid him, for no one who does a work of power in my name can easily speak evil of me. And the one who is not against you is for you. There are other people out there that are doing good works in Jesus' name. You don't know who they are. They may not believe exactly what you believe. They, not, they may not be doing exactly what you are doing, keeping the exact same days as you are, but they are sincere in what they're doing. And they are doing good works in the Father's name. Yes, they are. Who are you to judge them? How can you judge them? You don't know them. And you don't know what God is doing with them. You have no idea. Humility, again. Don't think of yourself more highly of yourself than what you actually are. Some of these people may even be going to church on Sunday. A lot of good work happens with Christians who are deceived in a lot of ways but are, are truly trying to follow Christ. They have a very good heart. They're doing the best they can based on what they know. How did you come to the truth? And how did you come to become a Sabbath keeper? Instead of going to church on Sunday, you're coming to church on Saturday. I went to church on Sunday for many years. And I honestly, truly tried, you know, to learn about God. I would open my Bible and I'd read it and I would love what I was reading. I wouldn't understand a lot of what I was reading sometimes. That's how it begins. That's how it begins. Most, most Christians today, most Christians today, not all of them, but most Christians today, or ones that profess to be Christians, are truly trying to be Christians. Not all of them understand the deeper truths that you guys do, but they are trying. And it will be much easier for them to be converted in the second resurrection, or in this lifetime, in their, their lifetime too, when they do hear the real shepherd. I mean, most real Christians today have not heard the real gospel. They, they, they've heard something that's close in a lot of ways, but they haven't heard the real gospel most of the time. These particular Christians, if they do, that's why we do this. That's why we that's why we preach. That's why we evangelize. So that people that are really searching can hear. And then they can be converted. And they want to follow God. They want to find Christ. They do. They really truly do. But Satan is the God of this world right now. And his task is to deceive. And he is the great deceptor. Revelation twelve nine, is it? Like that? Revelation 12, 9. Satan deceives the entire earth. 
Satan is the great deceiver of the entire earth. And what he wants to do is to deceive as many potential Christians as possible to the truth. He wants to do that. And he does that very effectively through false shepherds, which we talked about last Bible study. There's a lot of false shepherds out there. A lot of the shepherds that are false out there are also de are just deceived themselves. They haven't heard the truth properly either. But some of them are actually pretty, pretty bad. But most of them are not. Most of them really are truly doing the best they can based on what they know. Most of them are. The vast majority of them are. They're doing the best they can. But until Satan is finally removed from this earth, then that cloud will be lifted. Okay? There's a lot of deception in the scientific community, too, about things in science. There is. You know, the great mystery of why cancer is so rampant and why one in six children have some kind of learning disability, why there's a one in 33 uh, percent right now of children with autism is not a mystery to some in the science community, but for the vast majority, there is. But this is not a subject for that. But the vast majority of the science community does not understand what that is all about. All the autoimmune diseases that are out there. Why humankind is so sick. They don't understand that. The vast majority of the scientific community does not understand that. But there is a reason. And that, that's not a subject for this. Okay. But there are a lot of scientists out there that do understand this kind of thing. But the vast majority do not. It, their, their knowledge is clouded by old traditions of science. It is. Anyway, let's not, let's not delve into that. Let's go to Matthew 18, verse 6. But whoever shall cause one of these little ones who believe in me to offend, it would be better for him that a millstone be hung around his neck, and he be sunk in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. Whoever offends someone who believes in Jesus Christ and causes them to lose faith. That's a very bad thing indeed. Woe to the world because of offenses. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. For it is necessary that offenses come. That's a strange statement too. Why is it necessary that offenses come? To test you, yeah. To test you. How else are you tested? You have to be refined by fire. Fire purifies things, doesn't it? Fire purifies things. <clears throat> and if you're offended, by something. You're being tested by fire at that moment and you're failing. If you are offended, why would you be offended? You're having a lack of faith if that's happening. Can anybody offend you? Have any of the churches that you've ever attended offended you? Have any church members offended you? Have any in your own family or friends or people in general offended you? How do you deal with that? 
Offenses will come. <clears throat> How do you deal with it? You cannot be offended in a way that changes who you are in your standing with Christ. You, you can't. You cannot. You cannot. <clears throat> it is necessary that offenses come, yet woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Woe to that man who causes someone who believes in Christ to stumble. <clears throat> but it's also sad that if you are offended by that, individual and you succumb to that because your faith is not strong enough to withstand that you have to not be offended by anybody you have to be able to withstand that Luke uh, Luke 17 verse 1 says something about that Yes. Then he said to his disciples, it is impossible, it is impossible that no offenses will come. It's impossible. But woe to the one by whom they come. You are not going to go through this life without having somebody offend you in some manner, shape or form. How do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? Matthew 18, verse 8. <clears throat> and if your hand or your foot causes you to offend, cut it off and cast it from you. Are you literally supposed to do that? No. No. For it is better for you to enter into the life lame or maimed than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to offend, pluck it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to enter into life one-eyed than to have two eyes and to be cast into the fire of Gehenna. Gehenna is that fire outside of Jerusalem where they burn the garbage. And they would throw criminals there, too. You know, people who were criminals, who were the dregs of society, they were thrown into this fire, this pit outside of Jerusalem, and be burned up. They wouldn't have a proper burial. That's what Gehenna is all about. That's what hell fire is. Is your, you're just, your garbage. If you cannot... If you cannot follow Christ, if you reject Christ, if you just utterly reject him, you're those broken branches that wither and die. You're, you're part of the vine that was broken off, and without the true vine, you just wither and die, and you're gathered up, and you're thrown into this fire, you're just, you're just burned up. It's refuse. It's not being tortured forever and ever and ever. It's just getting rid of the garbage. Gehenna is not an everlasting, burning, hellfire, torturing people. It's not. It's not. It's just cleaning up the garbage, cleaning up the refuse. You don't want to be part of that, you don't. But if you're offended, if you're easily offended, and you lose faith, that's what is possible. You cannot be offended. You're not supposed to cut off your foot or pluck out your eye. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. But you know what that means.
Mark 9 talks about a worm. That's a weird, weird thing. I want to go to that. Mark 9, 42. But whoever shall cause one of the little ones who believe in me to offend, it would be better for him that a millstone be put around his neck and be cast into the sea. And if your hand shall cause you to offend, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than go with two hands into the unquenchable fire of Gehenna. Unquenchable. Interesting words there. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. What is this worm? There's no real good explanation about that. There isn't. Isaiah 66 talks about that. That's where that comes from. Let's read what it says there. Isaiah 66. Eric? Yes. Uh, our translation, um, the worms, so plural, that eat them do not die, and the fire is not quenched. Yes. That's what ours says. But what does that mean? <laughs> the worms. Isaiah 66, verse 22 to verse 24. For as a new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so will your seed in your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one month to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. And they will go out and see the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, who were offended in him and rejected him. For their worm will not die, nor will their fire be put out, and they will be an object of abhorring unto all flesh. In other words, it's a lesson. Those who rebel, those who are offended and reject Christ, will die, will be burned up in this fire, and it will be seen as a memorial for all. This is what happens to those who reject Christ. You're not living in a hellfire being tortured, as most Christians think today. You're not. That's, that's ludicrous. What, what kind of a loving God would do that? <clears throat> what kind of a loving God would do that? That makes no sense. It makes no sense at all. And what about all the people on the planet that have never had a chance to accept Christ? And they die. What? They're, they're doomed to this Gehenna fire where they're going to be tortured forever and ever? That makes no sense. That makes no sense at all. None. No. How many different religions are out there right now? There's tons. There's some that are very extreme, actually. These people are just deceived. That's all. But they will have a chance to learn. That's called the second resurrection, when they're raised up again from the dead. They will learn. And what about all those people that lived before Christ even was born? What about them? Doomed. <laughs> what, they're, they're, they're in hell right now, burning, everlasting, because they, they were unfortunate enough to be born before Christ came? Babies that die, where are they? Yeah. I mean, seriously. I mean, it's nonsense. It's nonsense when you think of it. That's why some churches came up with this place called purgatory. To somehow explain where all these lost souls could be because they never heard of Christ. And they're, and they're just waiting, it's like a way station or something or other, until they can 
get passage to heaven. And that's a man-made concept. It's utterly ridiculous is what it is. Anyone who does not know Christ in their lifetime will be raised from the dead and they will have an opportunity when they are raised from the dead because God will raise them from the dead for the purpose of teaching them who he is. Christ will be there. And they will see him. And they will see all of the people who did follow Christ and are changed and are there as kings and priests in the kingdom. They will see these people who are now God-like beings. They will. And Satan will be gone. He will be removed. There will be no more deception. He'll be gone at that time. But astonishingly enough, as it seems, you can read in Revelation, or as a different Bible study, there will still be people who reject it, even then, with Satan gone. That's astonishing in itself, that even with Satan gone and, and God right there before them. Well, look at look at the Israel, look at Israel in, in through uh, the books of Moses, right? All the all the miracles that God performed to free them from Egypt, and they're wandering the they made him wander in the desert for forty years because they kept rebelling. They even made other gods. They complained about the manna. They complained that there was no meat. They complained about this, they complained about that. They complained about the different civilizations that were before them. Oh, they're going to kill us, blah, blah, blah. And God was right there. and it, it, The cloud was there. God was there. And God punished a lot of them and killed a lot of them. Right? Sent serpents into their midst and killed a lot of them. And, and they rejected him. Well, he was right there. It's astonishing. It's astonishing. Put yourself there right now, crossing the Red Sea with the water. Well, Charlton Heston, that movie, that was a great movie, wasn't it? Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, it was. Hollywood. But picture yourself being there. I mean, Pharaoh and, and his army being withheld by the fire and the sea parting. And you're walking on dry land through the sea. And then shortly thereafter, in a matter of days or weeks, you're complaining about God. Why did you take us away from Egypt where we had all this food and luxury? They were slaves. They were abused. They were beaten. They had no life there. <clears throat> And yet they're complaining. And they saw these things. What miracles have you seen? Have you seen any real miracles? I haven't seen any real miracles. Not like these Israelites did when they were freed from Egypt. I haven't seen things like that. But yet they saw those things and they rebelled. Still. That's astonishing. So it will happen that people will still rebel, even in the, you know, when Christ comes back and Satan's removed. Don't ask me to explain it because I, 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 I can you explain it? I, I, I can't explain. Oh, the Red Sea. I think it was just a strong, strong no, wind. No. Oh, it yeah. wasn't the Hollywood version. No, <laughs> not the Hollywood version. No. Talking no. about how how they couldn't believe. Oh, they, they couldn't, couldn't believe. They couldn't oh, believe. Yeah. The flesh has no good thing in it. Human nature no. will complain. <laughs> and complain means to remain, and it was only a 10 day journey. I know. It could have been there in 10 days. I know. 40 years. Made it through Aaron and who else? Two. Two. Joshua. I know. Two out of the millions. I know. It, it's just, it's astonishing. It really is. I mean, yeah. I, 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 can't, I, I can't give you a good answer. I honestly can't. Stubborn, stiff-necked. Stubborn and stiff-necked, yes. Like a mule. Anyway, Matthew 18, verse 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones.
For I tell you that their angels in heaven continually look upon the face of my Father who is in heaven. We all have angels looking out for us. We do. And they report to the Father about us. They do. So if you offend somebody that's a follower of Jesus Christ, the Father will know about it because their angels will tell him. You better not do that. For the Son of Man has come to save those who are lost. Those who are lost. When Jesus was there at that time in Jerusalem and in Judea, he was there for the lost sheep at the time. Right? Why were they lost? Why were they lost? How do sheep get lost? The shepherd. What about the shepherds? Was it there? The shepherds were doing what? Sleeping. They were doing. They were not doing their jobs. Obviously, the shepherds did a miserable job. A miserable job. What were the shepherds in Israel doing? at this time. A miserable job. We learned that in the last Bible study about these shepherds. They were putting heavy burdens on them. Yes, they were. And the sheep were lost. Christ came to be the shepherd and to redeem those ones who were lost. And to supplant and thrust aside those false shepherds that were there, that were not doing their job, not doing what they were supposed to do. We read that in Jeremiah and Ezekiel the last time. What? Do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and, not, and one of them has gone astray, does not he leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and search for the one that went astray? I mean, they would do that. I mean, he's using another analogy of something that's real, because livestock was valuable. Valuable. If you lost your wallet, what, what lengths would you go to try to find it again? Especially if you had all your credit cards in there and your driver's license and a thousand bucks maybe in it or something. What would you do? I'd leave the rest of my wallets on the mountain and go find that one. <laughs> you, would, you, would, you would do everything you could. No? You would. If you have a thousand dollars in your wallet, you deserve to lose it. <laughs> exactly. Well, that, that's, a, that's an analogy for today. Back then, they didn't have wallets with a thousand dollars in them. <laughs> Livestock was valuable. If even one was lost, it was valuable. They would try to find it. And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the one or over the 99 that did not go astray. Yeah, I found my wallet. Hey, sweet. You know, seriously. You know, it's a good analogy. It really is. And these people would understand it in that term because that's what it was in those days. Today, if we talk about an animal that's gone astray, us. I don't have any livestock. It doesn't make any difference to me. No. Likewise, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God does not want anyone, anyone, to perish. It's not his will that anybody perish. He wants everybody to repent and come to him. That's what he wants. But he doesn't force 
anybody. He does not force anybody. But astonishingly enough, people will reject him. Just read through the books of Moses. They all died in the desert. Those that were older than 20 years old, that is. I think it was that, wasn't it? They were 20 years old? That generation. That generation, yeah. But the ones that were younger than 20, I mean, they, they were able to go. Except for two. Joshua and... Um, Caleb. Yeah. I think they were the ones that went into the land to, uh, to scout them. They came back, and they reported good things. But the other ones said, oh, those guys are scary. They're big. Right? They're going to destroy us. We shouldn't go there. And blah, blah, blah. Like, but Joshua and Caleb said, no, no, no. We can take them. We have God on our side. God let them go across. So then, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault between you and him alone. If he is willing to hear you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not listen, take with you one or two others, so that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. What is going on there? If someone, obviously, we're talking about in our, our community, church community right there, offends you or is doing something wrong, you need to discuss it with them, right? Obviously. But some people will not listen, and then you have to take it to other people, obviously. Truly I say to you, whatever you shall bind on the earth will have already been bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on the earth will have already been loosed in heaven. What does that statement mean? Does that mean that you can, or that the church has the powers to make up its own rules, and that, no. What does it mean? This particular Bible that I have has an appendix, and it talks about that. Let me read a little bit of what it says. You know, the Roman Catholic Church claims, we're going to pick on the Roman Catholic Church right now at the moment, because they do claim this, claims that Jesus gave the, to the Apostle Peter and his future successors the powers of binding and loosening so that whatever they would bind or loose on earth would be bound or loosed in heaven. They further contend that this authority grants an infallible pope the power to bind and loose, loose contrary to the word of God, thus making the word of God void. And this authority was given to Peter by Jesus Christ as recorded in Matthew 16, 19 and 18, 18. Aha. Uh -huh. In Basics of Biblical Greek Grammar, William D. Mounts gives a clear and insightful explanation of the underlying Greek text showing that what Jesus taught is entirely different from what many religious authorities assume, teach, and practice. He writes, in some translations of Matthew 16, 19 and 18, 18, it sounds like Jesus promised his disciples that whatever they bound on earth would be bound in heaven, and whatever they loosed on earth would be loosed in heaven. In other words, they had the power to bind and loose, and heaven, that is God, would simply back up their decrees. But the matter is not quite so simple. The actions described in heaven are future perfect passives, which could be translated, will have already been bound in heaven, or will have already been loosed in heaven. In other words, the heavenly decree confirmed the earthly one is based on a prior verdict that as God had already made forever. O oh Lord, your word is settled in the heavens. You can't contradict what's already written. You have to adhere to what's already written. You can't come up with something new. 
You know, it's already been bound in heaven or loosed in heaven. Jesus did not give his apostles and disciples the authority to make binding decisions regarding anything on earth that had not already been decreed in heaven. Jesus specifically taught that he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. Therefore, whatever is bound or loosed cannot be contrary to the laws and commandments of God. The revelation of the prophets or the teaching of Jesus Christ did not give his apostles the authority to loose any of the Ten Commandments or any of God's laws that are not connected with the priesthood and temple ritual and blah, blah, blah. It was, there's a whole bunch there. <clears throat> In other words, you, you cannot just make up your own rules. You cannot. And a lot of churches do. It's not just the Roman Catholic Church. You know what I mean? To pick on them because you know, the Pope is supposed to be infallible, right? So anything the Pope decrees is supposed to be gospel truth, right? And if he wants to change this or that, then he's entitled to because he's the vicar of Christ, which is Christ's representative on the earth, and he has the authority to do so. But no, no, he does not. And neither does any other church, church organization on the planet have any authority to change anything. They don't. They do not. They are causing the sheep to go astray when they do that kind of a thing. False prophets, false shepherds. Again, I say to you that if two of you on earth shall agree concerning any matter, that they wish to request, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven, <clears throat> according to the scriptures. Okay? For where two or three are gathered together in my name, which means they're obeying the rules of the scriptures in their disagreement to come to a reasonable resolution, right? Because they're in, they're coming together in his name, right? Read the book of Moses, there's, there's five books in there talking about if this happens, then this should happen, right? Or if this kind of complaint comes up, then this is the resolution and blah, blah, blah. That, and there's tons and tons and tons of that. It goes into great detail about all the different possible problems that could have happened in their lifetime, which are obviously different than ours now because we don't have the same kind of culture and lifestyle that they had, but it went into great detail about that. And then they had judges on the matter for that, to come up with decisions based on what was written there. So in my name, if you are doing it properly, then it will be bound or loosed. Not just arbitrarily, if, if, you, if you think you know it all, without following God's rules, you know, it's the way it is. <clears throat> there I am in the midst of them. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Until seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you until seven times, but unto, until seventy times seven. That's a lot of times. <clears throat> 70 times 7. A lot of times. But that's... Why is that? Why are those expressions used there, actually? Anybody know? There's no, no limit. There's no limit. There's no limit, no. No. But where do those expressions come from? 7 times? Or 70 times 7? That, those, that particular wording is, is used for a reason. It comes way back to Genesis 4. Right? <clears throat> Genesis 4, verse 18. And Irad was born to Enoch, and Irad begat Mahud. Yeah. I can't even say that guy's name. And that guy begat. Methusiel. <laughs> Methusiel begat Lamech. I, okay, Lamech, I can pronounce that guy. And Lamech took two wives to himself. The first, the name of the first one was Ada, and the name of the other one was Zillah. 
And Adah bore Jabal, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. And his brother's name was Jabal, he was the father of all those who corruptly played the lyre and the pipe. And Zalah also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. And Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, wives of Lamech, hearken to my words, for I have killed a man because he wounded me, a young man because he hurt me. For if Cain is avenged seven times, then truly Lamech is avenged seventy-seven times. Seventy times seven times is what he's saying there. And back in verse 15, you see this. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Sevenfold. That's the expression used back then about vengeance on people that offend and do wrong. In the New Testament here in Matthew 18, it's used as forgiveness. Forgiveness. How long? It's just an expression. As many times as it takes. What is 70 times 7 anyway? Math. Math. <laughs> Seven times seven is what? Forty-nine. Forty-nine. So add a zero to that four hundred and ninety times. Okay. Have you sinned four hundred and ninety times in your life? Yeah. Probably. You live long enough. What happens on the four hundred and ninety first time? Lightning. No. It's over. <laughs> my, my dad used to say, it's all over but the weeping. <laughs> he was referring to the Jets at the time. I heard a fat <laughs> yeah. He was referring to the Jets. The Winnipeg, the Winnipeg Jets. You know, whenever they got squirted upon, he would laugh or up or say, That's all over but the weeping. So what would happen on the 491st time? It's all over but the weeping. Right? And from then on, it's just free reign. You can sin as much as you want because it's all over but the weeping, right? No. No. As long as you still have a repentant attitude, right? And if somebody offends you 490 times, and you know, that's, that's awfully hard for one person to offend you 490 times, but it could happen, especially in a marriage. Especially in a marriage, that, that could happen 490 times. That's great. Especially in a marriage, I must say. Especially if you're living you know, together for 50 years or 70 or something like that. 490 times, that's going to happen. I'm, I'm declaring that now. That's going to happen. <laughs> 490 times, you're going to be offended by your spouse. At least. At least. But on the 491st time, that's it. It's divorce. You're gone. Is that what's going to happen? <laughs> That's it. It's all over but the weeping. That's a good expression. It's, that should be in the Bible, actually. I'm going to write that down here. It's all over but the weeping. It's now official. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's, that is funny. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 21. Then, yeah, we did that one. Verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is compared to a man, a certain king who would take account with his servants. And after he began to reckon, there was, there was brought to him one debtor who owed him 10,000 talents. But since he did not have anything to pay his Lord, <clears throat> commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and a payment to be made. Because of this, the servant fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And being moved with compassion, the Lord of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Which is exactly our situation. We have a debt through our sins that we cannot pay. It's impossible for us to pay. Can't do it. Impossible. And we come to our Lord 
and ask us and ask him to forgive us our debt. And he has. He did. He purchased your debt through his life. And he forgave you. Then that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, a much greater debt. And after seizing him, he choked him. Yeesh, that's pretty bad. Saying, pay me what you owe. Can you imagine that? Think of Homer Simpson and uh, Bart. Yeah. Why are you? <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah. Not that I watch that show much. Yeah, I'm pretty. <laughs> As a result, his fellow servant fell down at his feet and pleaded with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. The exact same thing. The exact same thing. But he would not listen. Instead, he went and cast him into prison, and until he should pay the amount that he owed, which was impossible. Impossible. Now, when his fellow servants saw the things that had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went to their Lord and related all that had taken place. And his Lord called him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you implored me. Because I am gracious, which Lord you know, God is. Were you not also obligated to have compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had compassion on you? And in anger his Lord delivered upon him, delivered him unto the tormentors until he should pay all that he owed, which was impossible. <clears throat> impossible. Likewise shall my heavenly Father also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother's offenses from the heart. As much as you try to follow Jesus Christ, as much as you try, if you hold in your heart this kind of an attitude to anybody especially a follower of Jesus Christ, you're not going to be forgiven yourself. You, you won't. It's stated right there. It's fact. In closing, Mark 11 clarifies that. Mark 11, verse 25. But when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, if you have anything against anyone, forgive. What else can I say about that? If you have anything against anyone, when you come to God in prayer, forgive. Even if that person has done nothing to reconcile with you. Even if that person doesn't deserve forgiveness. Who here deserves forgiveness? That's called grace. Because God is gracious. We don't deserve forgiveness. We don't deserve it. God gives us, grants us that because he's gracious. So if you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive, so that your Father who is in heaven may forgive you your offenses. For if you do not forgive, if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive you your offenses. Who has offended you? The most likely culprits of that are members of your own family, close friends, and associates. Complete strangers, it's hard for them to offend. You know, sometimes I get offended by my provincial government here. I won't say much about that. Or city council. <laughs> You know, some of the stupid decisions they make. But I don't know them from Adam. <laughs> right? And I know they do things foolishly. But that's neither here nor there. You still forgive them. 
even though it costs you out of your wallet, you know, the stupid decisions <laughs> that they make. But the most important thing, though, is a servant of Christ, someone who is a brother or sister in Christ, you have to. And if they have offended you in some way, or they're doing something that's causing offense to you in some way, then talk to them. Talk to them. Okay?